Uh, this is awesome. I'm so glad to, uh, to be here. I'm also going to disappoint you because today I won't be uh, flying drones with bananas. Uh, I will not do uh, psychological experiments on you. I really enjoyed those, uh, those yesterday. Um, I won't be talking about CSS either uh, because in my talk I want to focus specifically on HTML. HTML is that language that most people will check the checkbox in their CV and they'll say, well, I know my HTML. Um, but, you know, it's got a lot of power. Uh, HTML is a really cool thing and it's actually quite a complex beast as well. Um, so HTML enables a lot of things that we all like, such as the multi-device web. So the fact that we have the web work on so many different devices, like when the web was invented, there was just this really old machine uh, that we now would consider like old. Uh, and now we use the web on phones and on our watches, and the reason that that's possible is that we can write CSS. And the reason that we can write CSS is that we have a structure to program our CSS against, which is HTML. HTML makes all of that possible. It enables also uh, default style sheets that are in browsers. And you'd be surprised if you look at what sort of default styles a browser will apply to your website. I know we love to reset our CSS, but there's a lot of stuff that the default style sheet will actually make possible. Such as like if you have a table and you want to position two things next to each other, the default style sheet has you covered. Um, there is browse by heading, I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and there is uh, default behavior. For instance, when you have buttons, they are going to submit a form for you if you put them in a form and you use the default type. Uh, it enables reader mode, which is something that people with ADHD uh, love to use. But don't all of us love to use that in these days because websites get more and more complicated. So yeah, I have a fond love for, for HTML. As Roy just said, um, maybe we should stop doing JavaScript. Uh, let's focus on HTML. My talk is called It's the Market That Matters. Uh, and I want to tell you in this next 30 minutes about you know, why I think markup is important and how it can help users to enjoy the web more. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming to my talk. This was great. <laughs> Um, no, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Hida. I work at Developer Relations uh, in Sanity. Uh, we are a, a platform for structured content. We basically have as our mission to make it easier for uh, website owners to have content, for content creators to create it, and for developers to work with it, uh, to ultimately create better websites, uh, more interesting websites too. Uh, I also blog on hit.blog. You can like and subscribe there. I've got an RSS feed if you're into that. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter. I'll put the slides there afterwards. Um, I have a lot of links in this and a lot of things that I can't explain in detail. They are uh, in my slide deck that I'll be posting after this talk. Um, so yeah, let's talk about accessibility. I mean, we've heard Adrian yesterday uh, explain that what accessibility is. I'll do my definition too. Uh, it is to ensure that people with disabilities can use your site or your app. Now, a way that I like to rephrase it is that this also means that people with disabilities can buy your product, that they can spend money at your company, uh, or that they can use your service. Now, this is important because it concerns a lot of people uh, that you might not add to the accessibility category immediately. Uh, it's stuff like neurological conditions and motor impairments, uh, deafness, blindness, lots of different things uh, are all disabilities. And it means that a lot of people do things like using high contrast mode uh, so that they can see contrast more easily. Uh, it is that people zoom in on websites because they have no vision. Uh, it is that people reduce motion uh, because they could get physically sick of, uh, of motion. Uh, it is that sometimes people don't use a mouse. Uh, that could be because they prefer to use a keyboard. It could be because they can't handle a mouse because of all sorts of conditions. Uh, so basically, lots of reasons that different people experience the web in a different way. Now, I'll focus today about uh, specifically on uh, people who use assistive technologies. Uh, not because they are the most important category, but because that's where we can have most impact as developers. This is the part where we have a huge uh, impact uh, on people, for instance, who use voice control to control their computers. Uh, people who use a Bray display that converts what happens on the screen into Bray in real time. Really cool technology. Uh, people who use voiceover, uh, like technologies like uh, screen readers that will read out everything that happens on your screen. Uh, so yeah, lots of interesting technologies that are all powered ultimately by our markup. 
how does that work? Well, uh, you're probably all familiar with the document object model. Um, if you go to a website and uh, you request the website, the server is going to respond with markup, and the browser is going to turn that into a tree, the DOM tree. Now, what some people don't know is that there is a secondary tree, which is the accessibility tree. And browsers will generate that so that they can mark things like, hey, here's a radio button that's called round trip. You can select it and press it. Here's a slider that can go between 0 and 24. Uh, it's set to 7 at the moment, and it's called departure time. And you can increment and decrement it. Uh, here's a button that's search, and you can press it. Now, when you hear that, you might be able to imagine like a visual interface for this sort of thing. Um, maybe you have one in your head, uh, you can design one, but this is also the information that these assistive technologies will use in order to provide an interface for uh, users with disabilities. So in a way that it works for them. Now, the way that that works is uh, it generates an accessibility tree and that answers questions like, what kind of thing is this? Uh, so is it a button or is it a link or is it an input type? Uh, and that's called the role. So you'll find that in the accessibility tree. Uh, then there is how should we refer to it. That's the accessible name. So it's things like this is called departure time, or here is your save details button, or here is your click here link. Uh, and then there is a bunch of meta information, uh, like is this thing expanded, or is this checkbox checked? Uh, so that sort of information is there too. So this accessibility tree uh, is on every website regardless of whether you want it or not. So it's going to base that on the DOM tree and it's going to exist. So when I audit websites for accessibility, uh, I'll be looking for this information. So let's say I'm on a news website. Uh, I see a bunch of links in the top, so I'll go there and have a look. Like, oh, here, we see a, a role link uh, and it's called World. It's going to take us to World News. Uh, here's a role link that's called US Politics. Let's skip that one. Uh, a role link uh, that's called Business. And then there's a role button that's called Edition. Maybe I can switch editions there or something like that. Now, that information exists on every website, and I use that to figure out if, if my website is accessible or not, or my clients. So basically how this works is, as I explained, your markup will generate a DOM tree in the browser, uh, and then that's going to generate an accessibility tree. Now, from that point on, that information is passed on to so-called platform APIs, and they exist on all the big platforms. So they're on Windows, they're on Mac, they're on mobile phones. Uh, and these platforms ultimately integrate with assistive technologies. Um, yeah, so technologies such as screen readers, uh, braille displays, they'll get their information from there. Now, you can also get this information by looking in your browser. So uh, Chromium, Firefox, Safari, they all expose this information. You may have come across it as well. Um, so if you see roles, you see names, that's all information from your accessibility tree. So yeah, it's the markup that matters. Um, and let's talk about what that means in practice. Uh, with the following examples, it doesn't matter what sort of framework you use. What do you like to output your HTML? Because ultimately, it's all going to be HTML, and it's all going to be DOM trees. Uh, so that's what we care about here. Now, your markup can answer questions like, where am I? So when a user of a screen reader comes to your page, it's going to read out the title element that is inside your web app. Uh, so whether you touch this or not, like this could be living in some template that you never look at. Um, it could be like in a single page application where it never changes. Uh, but you want to make sure that it's got something unique. There's a really cool video with Leonie Watson, uh, a friend who is an accessibility expert and screen reader user. Uh, and she explains in that video that when she ends up on a website, this is what confirms to her that she's in the right place. So if she's shopping uh, online, uh, this is how she knows whether she's like in the vegetable department or in the clothing department. Like this is the information she needs to know, am I on the right page? Um, there is questions like, what is on this page? Which are answered by headings, so H1, H2, H3. Whenever you use these, uh, know that they are used by reader modes, but they are also used by a mechanism called navigate by heading. So in screen readers, most often users will start with this, so they will look for a list of headings, uh, which you can pull up. Uh, in some screen readers, you'll press the H key. Uh, and then you'll jump kind of between headings. It's a bit like when you call a customer service uh, and they go like press one for support, press two for sales. Uh, you'll kind of be redirected to the right place. That happens here too, but with your heading structure. So your headings are used for this kind of mechanism. So you want to make sure that the information that's in there is helpful. This is a heading I found on a marketing website. Uh, it says every detail counts. 
Now, I don't know what I'm going to find there. So if this is presented to me, I don't know where I'm going to end up. What would have been a good header there is something like specifications, because it went to the specifications section. So the words that you put in there uh, are, are important. I know this is not strictly developer, but yeah. Another question that your markup can answer is which areas are on this page. So um, there is this phenomenon called landmarks, and they let you specify what sort of thing is in your uh, website, what kind of sections. So yesterday when we uh, came into this uh, auditorium, the organizers were telling us, like, this is where the toilets are, this is where the community space is. So they've basically given us some landmarks for this very venue. Uh, and this is what you can do too for your uh, website or for your web page, really, like it's per page. Uh, you want to say, like, this is where my header is, this is where my footer is. Um, I won't go into too much detail on, on how landmarks work, but one thing that's important to know uh, is that you don't want to have too many of them. So in this case, we don't want to have a landmark for every chair that's in this auditorium. That would be rather annoying, like it's really hard to then find uh, what you're looking for. Um, there's a lot more detail in a post by Scott O'Hara uh, called Accessible Landmarks that I'll be linking out to. I think landmarks are a really cool way for people to navigate around a page in addition to headings. Uh, and I've once, and this is embarrassingly me quoting myself, um, I did a presentation on what browsers could do to make it uh, easier to uh, do accessibility. And one of the things that I mocked up for that was wouldn't it be nice if we could see landmarks in the browser so that we can actually look at that? Uh, there are some plugins that do that, but I think it would be cool if that was exposed by default so that people could all like navigate around websites uh, like that and without kind of relying on the user interface so they could see, like, oh, these are the most viewed articles on this web page. Now, for this mock up, I had to make up the landmarks because they weren't actually there uh, in the page that I used as an example. Um, but yeah, maybe that would improve uh, in that way. Something else that has a huge impact on uh, uh, web accessibility is form controls. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but one thing I want to highlight is naming. Uh, there is this nonprofit from the US that looks at the top 1 million websites automatically. Uh, it does some automated checking. Uh, and it found in 2022 uh, that almost half of the inputs on the web or on the web pages that they looked at were not properly labeled. So they were basically missing the accessible name part in the accessibility tree. So what this means is that stuff like input fields, radio buttons, checkboxes, all of that uh, were left without a name. Now, this can easily happen, right? You might build a user interface where someone needs to input a city, uh, and you'll have the word city there, you'll have the input, and then you look at the accessibility tree, and you'll find that the role for this input is text box or entry. That's good. That's what we're looking for. You get that for free with the uh, uh, input type. Um, but then the name is no or empty string. And the reason for that is that there's no connection between that word city that we can visually see uh, and the input that is right next to it. So the reason uh, we want to label this is to make sure that in the accessibility tree there is also an accessible name available. Now there's this whole algorithm called the accessible uh, name and uh, description computation specification. Uh, it exists somewhere on the W3C website, uh, and it has information on exactly how names are calculated. There is lots of ways that the browser will try and figure out like what is this input for. Uh, but one way that you can do it is to have a label element uh, with a for attribute that refers to the ID of the input. So they are both city in this case, uh, so they refer to each other, and that's now. Uh, uh, a properly named uh, input. Then I want to mention table semantics um, because there are some tales around that tables are bad for accessibility. They can actually be really good for tabular data. So if you have data that you want to display, tables make those easier to navigate for people with assistive tech um, if you use the right semantics. And one thing I want to focus on is the caption that is there. So let's say you're building like a financial website. I'm obviously not in finance, uh, but let's say you have like two tables and one is for 2018 financial results and the other is for 2019. Then this is how you distinguish between the two. You add a caption and then when someone with a screen reader goes to that web page, they will be able to find the difference between these tables. Now these are simple, they have two rows, uh, but I spoke to someone who was blind and was doing an internship at Deloitte, and he was looking at lots of tables every day, 
Uh, and he actually struggled with this because he had to go really deep down into uh, the tables to figure out, oh, this is actually the 2018 one. I'm not looking for this one. So again, a caption is like a landmark type of thing or like a heading that says, hey, you need to be here uh, for this information. And then I want to end with buttons. Uh, they are awesome for accessibility. Um, so whenever you use a button, people can find it in the tab order. Uh, they can press it with a keyboard, and they can submit a form even if they ask fills, uh, which is nice. Like that's a cool uh, default behavior. Sometimes people build buttons with divs. Uh, that's a lot harder to do. Uh, I won't blame you if you do it, but it's just a lot harder. And there's a lot of stuff that browsers do that you might not notice. Um, like keyboard behavior and like there's a lot of things I wouldn't even know from the top of my head what sort of things to, uh, to optimize for. So the button element is great. Uh, there's something special going on when you have just icons inside of your buttons because you know, where does the accessible name come from? Uh, if you have the button, it probably has something like an SVG right in there and the browser doesn't know what's on this SVG. In this case, you might recognize it uh, from some apps, then you will be able to add a reaction there. Uh, so that's what we are looking for here. But when we look at this in the accessibility tree, we'll have a button role, so that's good. Uh, but we have a name again of empty string. Now, one way to do that is to add a real label to the button. Uh, and that way we say, uh, this is uh, the add reaction button. It's going to show up in the accessibility tree. It's going to override everything that's inside of that. So the SVG that's inside of there uh, is actually going to be ignored. It has no value for the naming. But if there was text in there, it would also get ignored. So area label overrides all of that. You could also add a span in there and then put the content there, but if you don't want that visual, you need to visually hide it. So you need to apply some CSS that is not display non or visibility hidden. Now, uh, I love to refer people to this. It's the HTML specification specifically for developers. So HTML is where browser makers go to figure out how HTML is supposed to work. It's a really good resource, but it has a lot of browser-specific information. So this thing has that taken out, and it's specifically for developers. It has lots of examples. I go to it all the time, especially when I do accessibility audits, just to make sure that what I'm telling developers actually is what is in this uh, specification. Another great website is HTM Hell by my friend Manuel Matuzo. Um, you know, if you are used to the name, uh, it is actually really nice. Uh, it's got a lot of examples of stuff that random people found on the web, like usage of HTML that they don't agree with. Uh, and inside of that, there is also explanations of what could have been better instead. So I recommend that too. So we've talked about a lot of ways to use markup to do accessibility, uh, but obviously we are really interested in JavaScript here. Uh, and the good news is that there's some work happening at the W3C to take some of this stuff to JavaScript uh, in an effort called Accessibility Object Model. Now this is a collection of different specifications and web platform features uh, that would allow you to use JavaScript to impact accessibility trees uh, and to read them as well. This is exciting. Some of this is not available yet. Some of it is being experimented with. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to highlight it. And maybe in a few years, this is what we are using all day. Uh, one of the things that uh, AOM is supposed to do is allow you to set accessibility information uh, with IDL properties. So that means when you have a DOM element, you can set dot role, uh, set the property to button, or you can set area disabled as a property. This is similar to doing set attribute and doing it with an attribute, very similar, but now we're doing it directly on the element. Now this is user visible and user modifiable, which means that uh, if you look in your dev tools, you'll actually see it update in the DOM. There is another thing that is being talked about and experimented with in Chromium, which is setting this stuff internally. So you will put it inside a lowercase in kernels object, uh, and that will make it kind of part of the element that you're building. So this is relevant for people building web components. Uh, you'll be setting the role directly in your component, meaning that the person who is going to use that component cannot change it because it's like baked in. Uh, and that can be useful when you're doing like design systems and you want to make sure that the accessibility is uh, exactly as you uh, had uh, expected it. There's also some work happening around relationships without ID refs. I showed the example before with a label and an input. Uh, and this requires you to point from the one element to the other. 
That doesn't always work, especially in the context of, uh, of web components, because then you have shadow boundaries and they don't go across that. So you can't uh, refer to another element uh, of an ID that's inside or outside of the shadow boundary. That doesn't work, so there are some uh, proposals there, um, a, a thing called the cross root area delegation API. Um, read the explainer, it's really interesting what they are, uh, what they are working on there. Another part of AOM that's interesting is events from assistive technologies. Um, this seems like a really cool plan, so you would be able as a developer to know, hey, someone has used voiceover to click on this thing, or they've gone and used their screen reader to navigate here. Um, but very quickly, people found that, hey, this doesn't actually uh, meet the privacy requirements. If that information is available to uh, developers, it is also available to anyone who wants to collect data on users, and you know, that's bad. So the alternative is synthesized DOM events, and a lot of that uh, is already in place now. They are documenting it. Uh, so that means that stuff like a voiceover has clicked on this, or your voice control thing has clicked on it, it will just look like a click event. So as a developer, you don't know what the difference is and how the click has happened. You just get a click event uh, there. So that kind of works. And then the last part of AOM is reading accessibility tree from JavaScript. I think that's really exciting because it allows for better testing. Um, currently, when you want to test area attributes, you want to read the attributes that are available in the DOM. Uh, and with this, you could look at the computed stuff. So whatever the browser has decided a name is going to be or whatever the browser has de decided the role is going to be. It could be helpful when you have like two roles on an element, which you shouldn't have, but you know, bugs exist. Uh, so you might be able to find bugs more easily that way. Right, so going from uh, that, doing that in JavaScript, I want to go back to doing that kind of as part of HTML, as part of the, the web platform. As Tiger said earlier today, it is great to use the power of the web platform. Uh, he's using that obviously for home automation. Uh, that is awesome, I use it as well, but for accessibility, uh, because you know, HTML comes with a lot of accessibility built in. Uh, I'm obviously excited about that, the stuff that I've shown shows that like, HTML has all of that stuff, but the problem is that there isn't HTML for everything. So quite often we wanna build stuff that doesn't actually exist in HTML. Or maybe it does exist, like a date picker, there is input type equals date but it isn't very good, or it isn't the way that you want it to be. It isn't styleable, or it doesn't have the features that you want. Um, you know, and we've all been there. <laughs> we've all kind of built date pickers and, and done this sort of thing. Uh, it's a lot of work, and it's really hard to get it right. Uh, so there's another effort in the W3C called OpenUI, which was started by Nicole Sullivan from Google and Greg Whitford. He was at Microsoft and is at Salesforce now. Um, and the goal of OpenUI is basically to make it unnecessary to reinvent your own controls. So this group is working on a lot of primitives that will come to the web uh, and that you can use to build your own controls that will make it easier to, to customize stuff so that you don't need to start with divs and uh, make really complex things, but that you can actually uh, build it with HTML uh, that is really purposefully made for that. Now, I'm really excited because I think standardized controls can be a really big opportunity for accessibility. I was talking to one, someone yesterday who was working on a design system, and we talked about how like, design systems are awesome for propagating the right thing. So if you have a really good design, it's gonna propagate. Also, if you have really good accessibility, it's going to propagate because people are reusing your accessibility that is really good. If you do it badly though, like your bad stuff is also going to be reused and it's going to propagate badly. So this is you know, a moment of choice. You wanna really make sure that you're doing it well. And that's definitely the case for uh, components that we're bringing to the web platform because once it's in HTML, it cannot leave. Like uh, all the stuff that's in HTML has been there forever. Sometimes stuff gets deprecated, but it's a long process and we've got to make sure that it doesn't exist on any major websites because it would break the web. Now this work is happening. Uh, Nicole Sullivan tweets about that sometimes. Uh, she shares in this thing that it would be really cool uh, if you have something like implied accessibility semantics. So try and cover all of the accessibility bases in these open UI elements, um, which you know, she says it's really hard to get right, but if we do it, it's a chef's kiss. Uh, and I totally agree with that. Like it's hard to do, uh, but if we are able to, then I think that could be huge for, uh, for accessibility. 
So I have two open UI things that I want to share uh, and that are, to me, could be the future of, uh, of HTML. One is select menu. Who has ever tried to customize a select here? I see some hands, maybe. Yes, I can't see it very well, but I think I see a lot of hands going up there. Um, a lot of people have. Greg Woodward talked to a lot of developers and did a survey at JSCon of Berlin and asked, like, how do you all feel about doing a custom select? Um, and people didn't feel super happy. Like, uh, it's hard to build search and list UI kind of things. There's a lot of things that you can't customize. And a lot of people want to put arbitrary HTML there, like have some images with your options. Maybe you have like avatars or other stuff, logos that you want to have show up there. And that sort of thing is not possible with current select, right? You'll have selects, you'll have some options, and you get the browser UI. Now there's a lot of benefits to that. Like if I open this on my phone, then I get an interface that's really like made for my phone. So that's nice. Uh, you couldn't do that with a component you built yourself. That's a bit harder. Uh, but other than that, like, I want to actually be able to style the insides of this. Like, I want to add maybe a shadow uh, and make it pink or do something like a background image. Uh, and that sort of thing isn't possible uh, today with selects. Now, there is a proposal called uh, Select Menu, which basically is a bit like Select, but you call it Select Menu for reasons. Like, we couldn't extend the existing Select for this. Uh, for reasons, again. <laughs> um, but what this would allow you to do is style the select and a bunch of other things, uh, like replace the HTML that is inside of that. Uh, I'll not go into that, but I'll show you how you would style that. So in CSS, you would get a pseudo class that would allow you to style a part, uh, and then you can say which part you want to style. So you can style the button or the list box or uh, the selected value even. So basically all of the parts are available for you to style, just like you would style divs. And at that point, a lot of them, at least that's the hope uh, from open UI side of things, a lot of the reasons to make your own select kind of disappear because you are now able to do a lot of the styling. And if you can replace markup, then yeah, you can do a lot more there too. Now this, I'll do a browser supporting. This is still in discussion, right? So a lot of this thing uh, is still um, being discussed. It's experimental, but it exists now behind flags. So you can play with it in Chromium, in Edge and Chrome. Uh, if you turn on the experimental web features flag, uh, there is some accessibility issues still with it, but you know, it's promising. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear what all of you think uh, when you play with it. Now the second element I want to mention is the pop-up attributes previously known as the pop-up element. Um, pop-ups are things like what we see here. This is in the Sanity UI, uh, where you upload uh, an image, and you get like a little action menu where you can do stuff like delete the image or you know, interact with it. Now this kind of thing is currently often built with divs because it's really hard to like add icons. We have a heading in there. There's like a, a few lines and different colors. That sort of thing you can't do with the current select, but you might be able to do it with pop-up. Now, pop-ups are things like action menus, also uh, UI to teach stuff, uh, content pickers like that calendar stuff that we looked at earlier, uh, suggestions for form elements, and also the select that we talked about earlier. Now, the behavior that these things have in common is that they exist on top of other page content. Uh, so they are in this so-called top layer that the browser will ship with. That means you don't need to worry about Z-index and try and position it above everything else. Uh, because the top layer will take care of that for you, unless you put a lot of stuff in that, and then you still have that the nexus to deal with. Um, it on, it's only open when it needs to be, right? So when you click the button to open it, it's open, and then you close it again. Uh, and it's usually one at a time. So there's also some discussions around like this missing this automatically, like when you click outside of your pop up. So let's look at how that would work uh, if the current proposals go ahead. So this is all very much in flux. We meet every Thursday evening uh, about this, and sometimes we change attribute names and stuff. But you know, you would build something like the pop-up with maybe a div, a heading, and some buttons. Then you add the pop-up attribute, and now you have a pop-up. Now what this is, is that it's going to hide it by default. So when the browser loads this, the user agent style sheet will take care of that for you. It's going to hide the pop-up. And then when you call a JavaScript method, you can then open the pop-up, uh, which will then open it. Or you can do it declaratively uh, as well. So you would set an ID, and then you can add a button that has a toggle pop-up attribute, 
And that button is now going to toggle that pop-up for you. So basically, the kebab menu we have there could be this button, uh, and then it could open the, the div for you and close it again. There's also a hide pop-up and a show pop-up attribute in place so that you could do only one of the things if that's something that you need. Now, this is just pop-up on its own uh, as an attribute. Uh, the default value for that is auto, uh, which is the thing we see here. Uh, another value would be async, and that would be something like that we previously talked about as toast. Uh, so it would be like a warning or um, something like a success message. So here in Sanity UI, if you've uploaded an image or something like that, it's going to tell you that the uh, upload was successful. So you can do that with uh, pop-up equals async, uh, there's still some talk about like should that have array roles to announce it and stuff like that. Maybe that will uh, that will happen. Uh, so basically, you find that in JavaScript, you do your publishing magic. Like in our case, we run it to the API and then put it back and stuff like that. We'll get a message at some point, uh, and then we set the text content to something that we want, and then we show the pop-up. That's basically how that works, uh, and then it's going to show that. And the browser will take care of placing this on top of everything else and uh, that sort of thing. This is also available uh, behind flags. This syntax has only shipped in Canary a few days ago. So if you find it doesn't work, that might be because you haven't updated Canary. It's super recent, but again, we would love your thoughts on it. Um, OpenUI is on Twitter. Uh, you can find us there and we'll tweet out like questions. Uh, in this group, there's a lot of uh, browser makers, and I'm um, really looking forward to hearing feedback from actual developers to know, like, you know, does this make sense? Uh, are the attributes wrong? Uh, let us know. You can find us on Discord as well, and there's weekly meetings that we're also open to attend uh, for everyone. All right, so let's wrap up. Uh, I'm a little over time. Uh, the one thing I've talked about today is that markup affects accessibility trees. Every one of you generates markup at some point, unless everything you do is on a canvas, but you know, there's still gotta be some markup somewhere. It's going to generate accessibility trees and that's going to impact end users. Some is coming to JavaScript land, which is nice. Uh, you can play with it in JavaScript, and some of it might be coming to new built-in HTML elements. Now, I'm looking forward to that future. Uh, for now, you know, love your HTML. Um, look at the spec because there's lots of useful information there uh, to use HTML to the max and you know, use the power of the, of the web platform. Now, thanks very much for listening. That was all for me. Slides will be available on uh, that URL. I'll also tweet it if that's too, too long. Um, and with that, yeah, thanks very much for having me.